Our next technology is a little bit more advanced. Um, okay. it ha it's connected to GPS. It's a little, it's a little scanner that you put inside of one of the frames inside your entire hive. And it's, and it's monitoring 15 different sets. for joining i'm excited to have you i've got some really exciting news to john that i didn't um or haven't mentioned very much but our team has been editing and uploading our video content onto podcasts so we are on a podcast channel now on five or six different channels um, but spotify um, anchor google at moving forward with mandy kerr and so i gotta give a shout out go follow if you're into listening or you want to just put them on and play so you can listen instead of watch, definitely it's available for you to do that. But thank you very much for joining everybody. And I'm really, really, really excited to have you on today, John, and talk about our smart ag and sustainability and growing our profits for our farmers and all the good stuff. But more importantly, I'm really excited to talk about the bees. So uh, if you don't mind giving a quick intro about who you are and what you do, and then we'll dive in. Absolutely. You know, I, I didn't know what to do today, so I thought outside would be very unique. Um, you know, I, with the bees, there's, there's some bees behind me, and, um, you know, they're just living their life, uh, doing what they're supposed to do. Thank you, Mandy. It's been a pleasure, you know, being a part of the group. I've been on a lot of the different um, podcasts and watched you and interact with a lot of the hemp organization. Thank you for everything you're doing. And it's amazing. This oh, is, you guys uh, are awesome. Thank you. Excited. And if anything, uh, what you are doing actually inspired me to do what I'm doing. And I can talk about it, you know, a little bit about our bee situation. We created an Operation Honey Bee in 2014 as a way to improve bee population and improve sustainable agriculture. So we've been running down this direction as a not so known path, right? Cause the 2018 bill, no one knew their head from the tail about a lot of this stuff. And it's the same thing with bees. These are one of those things that can be very confusing to talk about. A lot of people don't know about them. Uh, plus it's not like they told us a lot about this stuff in school. <laughs> so this is a unique um, situation that we've got here. Uh, I'm a technologist, researcher, a student of life. And, uh, you know, I ran across bees and it just blew my mind. Uh, how I got into this was just through my own, my own yard. I got into the bees through my own yard. Uh, didn't really tell the paper to do too much. Didn't even tell him to put pesticides on my land. But he did it anyways and sprayed the entire yard with the dandelions in the yard with pesticides. And I've seen a lot of things and, you know, things have really touched my heart. But when I saw thousands and hundreds of bees dead because of my own uh, unknowing uh, yeah. situation of how reality is, it was just something that pushed me forward to look deeper into the issue and uh been very passionate since and uh since then we've we've created a lot of impressions worldwide about saving bees and uh we do have an accredited 501c3 and we've created billions of views online worldwide in regards to just getting the message out uh, not everyone likes to hear about pesticides so we've kind of changed our our team a little bit you know, it's more of just getting the information out there. We've done, we've, we've got a lot of partners in the, the bee realm. Um, lots of bee farmers are on board, uh, large uh, corporations that are trying to create the future of this industry. And uh, I've worked with um, the, the guy that has the largest uh, bee society uh, in the world. It's called the EAS. And I've worked closely with the president, um, Buddy May, out of South Carolina. A lot of the information about bees, no one's going to know everything. So it is kind of like hemp, really, right now. Not everyone knows everything. And, uh, and the great thing about what you put together is 
you know, we're kind of connecting everything, right? So it makes it, it just makes it great to have other people, other like-minded people that are trying to do the right things. They're passionate about this and they really want to change the, the world uh, and improve our environment, improve the lives and, and, and improve the community around us. So that's kind of how I got into this. And uh, I know you had uh, put a lot of other information on there. I run at three different things right now. You know, uh, sleep health technology, and that that actually, when we look at things about healing ourselves, uh, you know, figuring out all the different stresses in our life, we can actually figure out ways to improve our lives. We can actually improve other people's lives, and, and you know, that inward look and outward gaze, it really is important in a topic like this because we're all in it together. Whether it's hemp or it's bees, really, at the end of the day. You know, we're all running in the same direction. Hey, so tell me how bees, like, just like you, you know, I, I know there are plenty of people out there that are not educated, me, myself, about, you know, why should I be caring about bees? Why, what, and, and how does it really change or affect our agriculture? You know, being in the hemp industry and having this big concern and push or desire to really move the industry forward for the benefit of smart, sustainable agriculture. How do bees play? Yeah. What, what role do they play? Well, it's really easy. A lot of people have heard a lot of these types of cliches, but you know, one out of three bites of food we eat come from a pollinator. And when we talk about pollinators in operation honeybee, we're not just talking about the regular honeybee, whether it's Italian, German, or Africanized bees, we're actually talking about the entire native bee species and pollinators, including butterflies. So really what we're after is increasing just the general nature that existed before we started, you know, messing with nature and improving those bees too. So, you know, it, it, in, in regards to how important bees are, they are extremely important. The agricultural bees, which I'll talk about commercial bees that we use for like the almond orchards and, uh, you know, throughout all types of different fruits and vegetables, those honeybees are the best for agriculture. The native bees, the, the thing with native bees is this is their land and they do a good job, but we also need to uh, feed the world, right? So we've got to use the best of both worlds. And I'd like to make a comment on that because a lot of people that do bees, they say, well, uh, you know, to hell with regular honeybees. They're, they were imported from Europe, right? You'll hear this uh, often. And a lot of people don't know how the mainstream media works. A lot of times these large companies can, uh, can promote information and put it out there as regards to who cares about bees dying because they're, na uh, they're not native bees. And those types of information gets out there. And it's tough for me to explain this to people. So I'll explain it now because I get this question all the time. Yeah. Uh, native bees are extremely important. We need to increase native bees as much as possible. But we also need to be aware that uh, there was a study done. Uh, I'd like to cite the reference a little bit better, but it did happen this year. But they did prove that one of the major, one of the, if not the most major cause of bee deaths is the chemicals, right? Some chemical agriculture. Mm -hmm. And they've actually proved it. The guy has researched it and, and, and created the studies. Well, look uh, what it's done to our soil. You can't tell me it doesn't affect our bees when look at what it's done to our soil. Yeah, the, it just that runoff from from chemicals. Uh, I even believe, and I, I and I can't cite this, but I kind of believe the ocean. Uh, it's called a forever chemical. These don't wash off. We're actually drinking them in our water. Um, this these chemicals can run all the way through into the ocean and kill coral reefs. So. If I if we can help reduce any type of chemical exposure, um, that that's a big that's a big burden lifted off of all of us at the end of the day. Which is another another plug back to hemp, right? It requires a significant less 
significantly less um, pesticide and chemicals. Not, yeah. not, not, it doesn't disappear, right? There are still some that will be used. Don't get me wrong. We're talking, you know, a major crop, a major agricultural. Industry. Yeah, we're, we're talking about reducing the major, the major, you know, we're not flooding the, the monoculture with right. douses and douses uh, two to three times a year. You know, spot checking your farm is a, a lot better situation and sure. uh, you know minimizing that extra chemical usage and uh, bees are in general are just so important in just increasing yields right we talked about pollinators and what their importance are but i had a lady over the years i i have a couple mentors in this area and she told me she got into to beekeeping because she bought an apple orchard. And for the first five years, she only had a couple apples and she, and she was all ready to give up. And uh, she the same year, she said it was coincidence, because the same year she met a beekeeper, he, he had mentioned, why don't you just throw some bees on the, on the land and see what happens? So she, 20, 20 years later, she swears by the bees because it was the only thing that changed her apple orchard into something that produced crops, which, she, which was the whole reason why she did it in the first place. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, importance around bees and, um, and they're just like pets. So if, you get, if you've never been around a bee, you, know, you, get a, you get to play with them in the box. They actually usually don't sting you unless you're, you know, you've got the wrong energy or you're kind of just doing the wrong things, banging stuff too hard. But a lot of times I wouldn't wear too much. Sometimes I just wear the hat uh, without without worry, right? And I don't usually smoke them. I try to, we, we've always been that sustainable agriculture. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't use, uh, we would use sugar water. We would do, we wouldn't feed the bees granulated sugar. We would give them their own honey. You know, there's, a, there's a lot of little things like that that uh, people don't recognize, but bees, they're just like your pets at home. When you get one, they are walking around, they look cute, and there's a, there's a whole community going on, and they're communicating, and it, it's, just, it's just amazing. If you've never gotten to witness the inner workings of a hive firsthand, it is something magical, something definitely you'll, you'll never forget. Okay, so talk to me about how smart agriculture and technology plays into the bees and kind of explain to me what your technology that you guys have available and how people, how do people get their hands on it? Yeah, so if you can't measure it, you, you really can't do anything else, right? And, and same with hemp, right? If you can't measure results of your formula, then you really don't have anything. And we're both in the same arena in that aspect with hemp and bees, which I just love this topic. It just has changed my whole outlook. But if you can, if you can measure it, then you can actually, you know, figure it out. You can fine tune it. You can see the little different aspects of what makes a plant, plant grow. And uh, it all goes back to stress. So I made a post today about stress. It was awesome. Um, and I do Tai Chi, I talk about stress a lot. Same thing with plants. Plants and bees, if they get too much stress, the, the yield goes down, it fractionalizes, there might be too many weeds, there could be planted too close. How do you know as a farmer how far to, par to plant your crop? You know, uh, what, you know, how much sun is the optimal amount of sun? You know, there's so many different uh, variables to, to get the perfect crop. So we have two technologies. Um, one is the drone technology that mm -hmm. is a smart farm technology that helps the farmer increase his yield at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, farmers work extremely hard and new farmers that want to get into hemp, they may not have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of research invested and that type of thing. You know, our goal is to, to measure all the crop farms and hemp that we possibly can with these drones. 
uh, I was able to get the access to a military grade um, lens and work with these companies. I have been the guy speaking to what some people say are bad guys or good guys. It doesn't matter. I've always tried to meet these large chemical companies in the middle, uh, but they have been working on some technology as well. And uh, since I was a nonprofit, I got kind of grandfathered in. So we've got this cool technology that not only maps out your farm, it can tell you when you need the water or where you need the water. It can tell you, uh, it can tell you if you've got different types of plants, it can tell you a lot of information about genotyping. It can talk about, it can show you the fractionalization going on in your current crop. And, you know, utilizing this data is so important it can even measure the height without a farmer going out with a measuring tape and knowing exactly what's going on with the the farm so the drone well, I imagine are really this this is extremely beneficial being able to know well in advance when a wheel line's broken or water isn't getting you know before you've actually lost yield or crop you know waiting for it to be visible to the eye or may not even be seen at all depending on where it is it yeah, what a huge advantage. Yeah, this is this is the future, right? Um, you know, there's that story of do humans, you know, have all the knowledge they need uh, to make the right decision for the farm? What happens if you go on vacation, you come back, or, right. you know, there's just so many variables. I believe the future requires a technology like this to just maximize yield in general and, and create what was the kind of the baseline and see the difference between what actually goes on a lot of farms, whether it's different types of hemp, like uh, you had John Porterfield on there. He is more into the textile types of hemp, correct? Mm -hmm. So there's other types of hemp and even cannabis that this can be used. So, yeah. So depending on the different type of hemp that you have, you know, you could start utilizing a monitoring system to help maximize your yield at the end of the day. Because that's what it's all really about. And, you know, going back to sustainable agriculture, I feel like we are in that area of Ayn Rand's book, Atlas Shrugged. Like yeah. it's got to the point where, you know, the big guys came in. You know, there's all different money trails and different reasons why this or that is being done. Uh, but we are at the precipice of something major, especially with hemp and, of course, you know, with the bees and hemp together. So uh, monitoring the data is important and having the AI technology to not only take the data that was there, but to take AI and spit out solutions and other formulas that maybe people haven't looked at. Sure. This technology is also available with the bees. So I have two different technologies that can be used in current beehives. We've got a more of an older um, technology. You know those guns they use for COVID to check the temperature? Yeah. So there's a, a handheld unit. You can, you can take a picture of your beehive. It's actually a um, uh, uh, it's an infrared um, picture it takes, and you can actually see inside your hive before banging it around and moving stuff around to see exactly what's going on. Uh, that's a kind of a helpful technology for the beekeeper, uh, but our next technology is a little bit more advanced. Um, okay. it ha it's connected to GPS. It's a little, it's a little scanner that you put inside of one of the frames inside your entire hive. And it's, and it's monitoring 15 different sets. The beekeeper can actually know what exactly is going on, whether the, all the bees have left the hive or um, like swarm the hive and, and left, or if there's mites in the hive, all these little things you know, there's 15 broken down on how the beekeeper himself can go to hive uh, 299 and know that there's uh, varilla mites. He can go to, or he or she can go to the um, hive number 99 and know that 
you know, it's empty right now. So if you're talking about almond or, uh, you know, the almond orchard or this or that, this comes very handy. And if we can prove the difference between uh, this type of AI managed hive that does require a human to manage, it just helps the beekeeper make better decisions. And that's kind of what this is all about. All this data that's collected turn, uh, gets compiled, both the bee and the agricultural uh, crop get combined. And that combination of increasing pollination and increasing yield is exactly what you need uh, for the future. Yeah, I so talk to me about bees and hemp specifically, right? Because I think that I hear often, and you know me, I'm a firm believer in both the bees and hemp. But I, I, I'm not sure everybody believes it, right? So talk to me about what it, what is it about bees and hemp that make this a great pair that. You know, what really was your aha moment to relight your fire to say, I have a new passion and this is it? Well, I'm looking at things that are benefits to the environment. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, hemp is wind pollinated. So it's not, it doesn't require bees, right? But it's a food source for bees when they're hungry. So little story here. Uh, that going back to the native bee story where everyone's confused, right? Uh, native bees is a thing, you know, forget about the other bees. But in the 1940s, we had 5 million uh, hives that were monitored. Uh, today, we have, you know, more agriculture, but only 2 million hives. You know, what has changed in, in, that, in that time period? It's really a loss of habitat. Uh, as far as food choices for the bees, we talked about chemicals like pesticides and stuff like that. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the food sources for bees um, is really important. That might be a number one or number two. There's just rule, rule beekeeping is so much easier than, um, you know, suburban or a city bee. It's a it's a, a night or day difference. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about hemp. We're talking about more food sources. Sixteen different species of bees can use hemp for a, a, a food source, and maybe it's not their first one. Like let's say lavender. Bees just love lavender. They go right to lavender. Uh, but hemp, maybe not so much. Right? It's a it's a food choice, and if they have food. Some type of food is better than none, right? So, and uh, as far as carbon credits, as far as sustainability, hemp is the number one product. Henry Ford made a car out of hemp. All this stuff is, you know, things that you know, the average person, including me, didn't really have information about not too long ago. So hemp is a... Um, it's the best carbon, right? I'm into carbon in so many different ways. I mean, you match any other type of carbon to a hemp type of carbon, and, and it's just so much it's better. Okay. Yeah. And um, hemp and hemp and bees, the correlation is uh, hemp with the Constitution, the money. The American flag was made of hemp. I really believe it's about freedom. Hemp and freedom go together. Uh, bees are basically losing po uh, populations just because there's just too many humans. Fortunately, bee lives matter. Sorry about that. So where do we, I've heard that bees make CBD. Is that true? Like CBD yeah. honey. So there, there, um, there's quite a, there's quite a evidence to support both. But yeah. Bees, when bees are collecting, and you can't tell a bee only collect hemp, right? You can't say only collect like hemp pollen. They're gonna, they're gonna take from blueberry. They're gonna go to other flowers. So, but it even the studies show that inside the hemp there will be uh, CBD, and um, which makes sense. Yeah, yeah, they're actually THC. They, you know, as far as THC goes. The, the bees are not affected from the THC. 
So they're only, they're only interested in getting, you know, however they're digesting and fitting it out, you know, yeah. CBD does get added to the actual honey. And I'm not sure a lot of people knew that at the turn of the century or not. Right. So that's a um, medicine. That's a that's a medicine right there. Do you think that that will affect sales of you know, especially as we start to see this crop come up, and it's going to be everywhere. You know, look how many members we have that are growing or looking to grow, you know, tens and thousands of acres of hemp. Um, you know, where do you think that that because CBD is regulated, where do you think this may eventually play a role? You know, being CBD honey or honey that came from, because how do you how do you separate that at that point? I mean, it's a well, yeah. Um, I I I don't have the complete answers on that, but I think it's amazing, and I hope that they they run in that direction, and maybe there's a, a higher value for a naturally made mm -hmm. honey CBD product versus um, you know some of the others. I think I think it's great CBD the a uh, great product. Uh, I'm I'm more of a fan of the Delta Eight, um, but the you know both those products you know come from hemp, and uh, I just think the future of this is is just going to be explosive. Oh yeah, uh, hands down. I think we're just touching the the tip of the iceberg, right? Lots and lots of opportunity. Kate had a really good question, and I think we must have touched on it a little bit. But understanding a little bit of of cover crops. What are cover crops? Um, as far as uh, cover crops go, um, I am not the most familiar on agricultural in general. Um, I'm more toward bees. So as far as like cover crops, do you mean like, can you be I would more assume it, For me, I would assume this is, you know, and Kate, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume a, um, Oh, and Melvin's saying hi, by the way, Kay. I don't know if you guys are on the same page, but hello. Um, cover crop, you know, anything that's covering ground, right? That's what I imagined for cover crop. There's a difference in the hemp stock that's tall, you know, versus something that may grow. And I'm I'm with you. I do not know terms. I do not know plants or agriculture like I want. Well, to. Anything, right. all plants, if you put beehives on anything, anything that can be pollinated you know, typically will be pollinated eventually. They're going to go after their favorite nectars and stuff like that first, what they can find plentiful. But eventually, if they're hungry, they'll get along, they'll get around to it. So bees in general are just helping pollinate all the other plants around them, including whatever cover crop. If you're talking cover crop that's just like wind pollinated, like corn, uh, that type of thing, bees are not necessary, right? Uh, but as far as you're saying flowers, of course, my, my favorite flower versus crop is actually buckwheat. Buckwheat oh. could change the world too, right? Because it's, it's just, it's perfect for bees. It's a little seedling that you can make the awesome buckwheat pancakes with, all the different things. But flowers in general, bees love flowers. And uh, I'm behind some flowers and I'm sure there's quite a few bees over there to eat. I'm going to take a look. That's awesome. Kate just said that there's lots of money, and we've talked about this a lot as we've started to, you know, hemp has really unfolded lots of different opportunities, including funds coming down from the USDA and where money is available for planting for pollination, right? And I think that, you know, we're, this isn't the first time we've heard that bees need to be a focus for our farmers, right? Um, well, not just farmers, for consumers to be aware, you know, what's what's happening and what is needed and that they're a vital piece to our crop success. And your apple story was a perfect example. If somebody, um, say some of our big farmers want to get in touch with you, John, or put bees in their field, how does somebody go about doing that? You know, where do we, where would I find somebody? Well, you can find us at um, operationhoneybee.com on Facebook. We're Operation Honeybee Worldwide. Uh, Facebook is the happening place. Of course, in the on the website, you can email someone or reach out to you guys at Global Hemp. And, you know, we're I feel like we're side by side, you know, running at the same thing. 
any way you can reach out to me, find me on my Facebook page as well. Happy to go over anything. Um, okay. We've got a lot of people that have bees in general that have swarmed. They call all the time. And, and if you do have bees that swarm and you don't know what to do, you know, the typical way of the last couple decades is you just spray them or kill them. But don't do that. Give us a call. We'll find a sustainable beekeeper that will take your bees typically and do it for free unless they've got to cut a wall out of your house or something like that. But if it's a simple bee situation, call them. They can get your wheat. They can take your bees and put them in a place that can help them grow. Like these hemp fields, right? There's as we keep growing this, there's a couple questions I want to go over. But real quick on the back to the hemp. Do you see that uh, pollination from and I've asked around about this, but I'd like to share because we get a lot of farmers that are growing hemp for high CBD content or high resin. Right. As we're as we're seeing more and more of these fibrous fields, you know, hemp being grown for fiber or herd going up. Um, do you see cross pollination being a concern? Well, this is a great question, and it's also a tricky question. And I've asked a lot of the members that you've brought on, and I've, la I've asked a lot of other other members too. So, you know, I've heard, you know, keep keep them separated, maybe five miles, if you're okay. I've heard, you know, planting more of the cannabis indoors and leaving hemp outdoors is a great situation, or vice versa, if you want to keep your cannabis. Uh, crop protection. Yeah, because well, this, is where, this is where it gets tricky, John. Um, so from what I understand and research, bees are not the concern. Bees will not cross pollinate wreck the field. It's the wind. It's a drift crop, right? And so this is where that four and five miles comes in. And I'm not an expert and I know that it's concern that's been brought up, but um, I do. I just more and more that I've asked around the the science or the studies have shown the bees from one field to the next or will not make as big of an impact as the wind if you're parked too close or, or planting too close. However, where I see problem and where this has been brought to my attention is who's first planting? As a hemp farmer, it's public knowledge who, who's planting, right? Who's farming um, or processing hemp. Cannabis is not publicly available. And so if I have a farm and it's public knowledge, or if I go in and plant and I'm unaware of that cannabis farm, yeah, who's first and how do you know as you're making plans? So I think that that's a topic I think we should talk about a little bit, but uh, other side, but it's definitely, a, you know, we talk about cross-pollination and where that's headed. Um, but Barry had a good question and, any medical benefits of using hemp or, me or marijuana leaves in tea? My friend Edward Wallace introduced me to the olive leaf tea benefits. Asking for friends. I have no idea, but I'm a big tea drinker in general. So tea, um, I, I can't see it being a bad thing because it'll have antioxidants in it and maybe some PVD or whatever. But uh, I there's a lot of people. A lot of people are using it right there's a lot of companies i actually interviewed um a young lady out of czechoslovakia and she and that's what she's done they've supplied all of their large tea and uh liquor manufacturers with leaves from hemp i've heard of people using the hemp leaves kind of like they use wheatgrass and extracting oh, yeah. it, it for breakfast and stuff like that so that could sure. be another uh, another benefit, but you know, going back to the, the all the different aspects of hemp and what is more important, hemp or cannabis or all that. I I think you've got to look at you know I, I you know if they want to do a vote of what's more important. I I think at this time, you know, reducing reducing the large monocultures or taking a percentage of monoculture land and you know, dividing it up with and giving it to hemp, I think is really important if we're going to get this uh, to a mass scale. And but on the same token, the cannabis with the higher THC levels is super important. And those people that all that will, they don't want their strain to get mixed up. And you know, 
we understand that. No one wants uh, that to happen. So it's just one of those topics where, you know, it's just hard to tell. I think hemp is the leader just because it's it just has so many more usage. As far as the cannabis, of course, there's a lot of usages as well. But you know, as far as uh, I'm, in, I'm into the medical and health, so all the aspects of that is great. But I'm also really liking Delta 8. Let's type that. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about Delta 8. I mean, we've kind of dove into this a little bit, just you and I, and um, there have been some questions about you know where it can be shipped or some of the regulations and so forth. But talk to me about some of the benefits of it. And I know this well, is different from bees, but I mean, health is wellness is really what's gotten most people into or peaked interest into the, health, the cannabis and hemp industry, right? And so... Well, I would think that, you know, another call or another podcast can be done with Dr. Greg Carter. He's our chief medical officer. You know, he's a, he has three doctorates in um, medical marijuana along with, um, you know, he's a chiropractor and, and an acupuncturist. And um, he's also a veteran, ex-Marine, and he has focused on helping veterans with PTSD, one of his uh, weight people know about them. He can speak to a lot of the intricate, you know, medical claims. Um, he actually has never done uh, the cannabis, but he sees the most promising thing that's ever happened. And in his own world, in his own words, that Delta is the, the most significant thing he believes out coming out of cannabis and marijuana, only because you know, he's someone that doesn't do it, but he doesn't want any psychoactive mm -hmm. if he were to do it. And he's he, he's already tested it on a couple patients and they were they were intrigued with it too because it, it's really just about the body pain and uh, it's something that you could possibly do even at work uh, if you had significant pain. Yeah. You, know, uh, you know, a veteran with PTSD or, you know, had had a health issue. This, I think it's a great, I think it's great. And, and the fact that Delta 9 turns into Delta 8, it just, I think it was just meant to be. So. <laughs> it kind of just makes me question more and more regulations. You know, like, what are we doing trying to regulate it when, like you said, it's part of the degradation or breakdown process, the process that breaks down. And I don't know if it's from CBD or yet yeah, Delta 8 or Delta 9. I'm not the chemist at all, but. Yeah, the more and more I hear, the more and more reality sits, 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 wow, sorry, sits in that we just, we need to relieve some of these regulations, right? So talk to me about business-wise. Where do you see you get you, your either Operation Honeybee or your smart, you know, sleep technology company? Um, where are you guys headed and how can we really step in and support you? Well, thank you, Mandy. I think it's all connected. We're in this symbiotic relationship with each other where we all need each other and the only division is maybe might be in our minds uh but everything's connected the healing of ourselves the healing of our planet to um you know we're at we're at a time it feels like a, a reset has actually happened in it in, in so many different ways even a financial reset mm -hmm. you know, so we're all in this together um the more we separate uh, and try to go down our, our own ways will actually uh, will be the, the culmination of our end possibly. So the tighter we're all together on this, we're improving and it is a living, breathing document, right? Everything we're doing is a living, breathing document. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that means, you know, improving, improving all the different aspects of what we're working on. So seeing that as the most important thing uh because if even if the world and everything were to break down you know it's definitely not all about money and money is super important but it's also uh i talked to a couple of guys you had on here and i love the lawson lawson he is passionate he is really wanting to change the world mm -hmm. and uh, i like working with people like that because you know there's an anytime there's energy and passion like that you know, we, we have a real chance to make real change really fast. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we need. 
Well, and I, I commit, you know, and I know that you've been super involved and I want to thank you for all of your involvement with the association because that's exactly what we're building or working to build, right, is linking arms with other leaders. And like Barry said, highlighting those that are doing it right um, because it is about community and more and more it's about the relationship, right? Um, what type of people, you know, what would really take the organization or the awareness around Operation Honeybee or the value of the bees to the next level? You know, what, what, what do we really need in order to take it? Well, we got to get with farmers. We got to get with more farmers. And we talked about a cultural revolution. So as far as, you know, don't spray your dandelion. You know, utilize your yard better. I know everyone wants the perfect uh, manicured lawn, especially living in the Midwest or anywhere else. They have these perfectly manicured lawns, which are so beautiful. But it's also, there's a lot of gas being used. You know, do they ever even walk on the, on the lawn? You know, utilizing just more of a sustainable outlook. And I think, you know, um, uh, on a cultural level with society and on a farmer level. there's So there's a really important thing I'd like to talk about and it's called geopathic stress. I talked about stress in humans. I talked about stress in bees. I talked about stress in plants. There's a formula. There's a formula how to mitigate stress. If we think, if you figure out all the, the real movers and shakers in the data, and it's all about reducing stress and increasing growth and doing it in a, in a fashion that's not, uh, you know, in some realm that we don't understand as much, like genetically modified, you know, reducing the man-made and increasing what, you know, the data collection is not, it is what it is. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a process that's actually messing with the crop really um yeah there is a little ai thing that goes into the hive that has a battery uh but it's already been tested and proven that it's not you know bees or anything like that you know those different things like that are the the key to real transformation and sustainability right if we're not there it's got to be able to sustain and sustain better and i think the less you know, we talk about the chemicals and the rotation crops and ground cover. And, you know, John said, you know, when are bees pollinating in different times and different crops and providing food for different, that's all part of sustainability. And that's what increases our yields, which then puts money back in our farmers' park pockets. And in the long run, real, realistically, none of us will have food if we don't change and start taking care of our farmers and our rural agriculture, right? It's not all big ag. We need big ag, but it's got to be sustainable within our community, right? Within who you work with, your relationships and so forth. Um, Kate made a really good point. I just have to, go ahead. Real quick, I, you know, the yeah. other thing I like about hemp is you can get two to three crops. Each time those crops flower, that's more food for bees too. I mean, usually plants that are just living in like here, these flowers behind us, they're blooming in winter. Uh, yeah. Not every plant is like that, but the different blooms happen. So, you know, the bees go to different plants during the season. That's why we have four different types of honey, because even in the, in the summer, there's more pepper plants. So the honey tastes more peppery. You know, in the, the earlier uh, spring, you have a lot of clover. So the, even the honey flavor changes because they have to go find the next source of food, and whether that uh, plant is pollinating at the time or not, uh, it's really important. Hemp does it, can do it two to three times a year. Yeah. It's just awesome. It's got it's five, it's got five fingers. So it's, yeah. Well, and again, it's another fit. This is something that, okay. So real quick, as we move on, um, and I want real quick to give our association a plug because as we build our network, the connections that have taken place to help grow the supply chain and the sustainability around hemp or around bees has been pretty impressive, wouldn't you say, John? The the number of people that are highly interested is definitely there. I, I've noticed 
you know, we brought, we talked about bees and everyone is, no one, I, I haven't met one person that says I hate bees. So, <laughs> right. Right. Well, and it just goes to show, you know, I've said for a long time, hemp is an industry. And now more and more, I feel like hemp is something that belongs. It's part of every other industry, even the bees and the value to match matching them up. Right. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about if somebody is coming into our association or wants to get involved in our group? What can they kind of expect, John? What you know, who are some of the people you've been able to meet and interact with being somebody that wasn't in hemp specifically? You know, you weren't necessarily diving into hemp all, all head first. Yeah, uh, actually, Kate found me through my sleep health technology and um, and she knew that I did bees. And I don't know, it just it just was the perfect timing. Maybe I'm, I'm not sure. But Working with you, Manny, was great because I was actually watching your videos and I liked your personality. Um, and you. you know, it's not hard to look at you as well. Uh, also, I'll pay you later. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, also, I learned so much. You had set, I'm just um, uh, an amateur versus all the people that I'm watching. You know, I saw the John yeah. post on there. These guys know so much more. I am. I'm just a fly on the wall and a lot of this stuff, but I have learned, I have increased my knowledge exponentially just because you have such high level people uh, on these podcasts. I'm usually a little intimidated when I'm seeing these, these uh, deities in this space talking about all the information. So, you know, I'm just a student of life. So I'm just trying to improve what I know and learn from others. But, you know, as far as all the different things that you guys brought to the table, uh, it's real easy. I, I clicked the like button. I went to the website. I signed up, got the membership. Uh, I want to help support you guys in any way I can. I uh, want to be a part of uh, the future of helping uh, heal the world through the yeah. different, different avenues that we're running with. Absolutely. Well, and... Thank you very much for coming in because I, you know, and I've said this over and over again, hemp has revealed passions of mine that I didn't know existed and important things like bees to help move the industry along that then again, go back to our farmers and our agriculture. Um, and so, yeah, I think opening up the diversity has been pretty eye opening as well. You know, and the number of people every time that come, come in, when you say bees, after every meeting, I get two or three people say, connect me with the bees guys, connect me to John. <laughs> so it's been great. Well, uh, one time I was Fox News bee guru. So they let me, they let me get on Fox News and I was That's talking cool. about all this stuff. But what I realized too, during that time, they would never let me talk about anything truthful. I couldn't talk about pesticides. I couldn't talk about GMOs. I tried to learn to try to throw that in every word. That still didn't work. This is an open online platform where I can talk about whatever I really want to. I keep it, you know, PG-13 rated. Um, and, uh, you know, we can actually have a real conversation without being, you know, someone else delegating what I'm saying. So I quit being the bee guru for Fox News because they would take a clip that meant nothing. And usually when you hear about bees, it's just sen uh, sensationalizing the news. Remember the killer bees? Mm -hmm. Those killer bees have been in North Carolina for five or six years, but the news brought it out. Same thing with all the other things. I've really, really been censored over the years. Uh, a lot of people know me as a small business kind of um, a leader, only because I beat $2 billion companies in court, and it wasn't easy. Um, Good job. Thank you. Thank you. I'm it impressed. Was, well, and John, I have to tell you, I'm impressed by you. You continue to show up and provide solid. You said earlier, you're a little intimidated by the people on our show and you shouldn't be, right? You have an expertise in fields that add extreme value to other people's organizations and to ours. And so, yeah, thank you very, very much. So as much as, as you say, you're intimidated maybe about hemp because like John Porterfield is very, very knowledgeable and leading around the the hemp and fiber, um, not maybe so much about AI and bees. 
<laughs> well, you run at what you're passionate about. And if you believe in it, sometimes other people uh, may not believe in it or and, it. and really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, right? But, you know, uh, after I experienced this, this different types of things for large corporations, which there's nothing wrong with the large corporations, but I'm more involved in the local uh, community, trying to bring the local community back. I love small farmer markets. I love fresh food. And if you look at all the data, it's showing that the most explosive area is small farms. So a small farm initiative is very important. Hemp is, I think it should be the number one small farm crop in these next few years. And if, if whether, whether something major happens or not, we really got to put our thumb on the small farm agriculture right now and make sure there's enough food uh, for the future. I think that call was there a call a couple couple times ago about people having to throw food away? Mm -hmm. it, you know, that was, I mean, it could have been used for oil or something, I guess. Really? Just throwing good food away just because, you because know. Because supply chains are broken, right? And I think this goes back to the value of what you're passionate about. You know, we, we and our, our rural areas... Um, I'll just kind of recap what we were talking about, that the supply chain when the pandemic happened and the food shifted from the restaurants to the um, grocery stores, there wasn't a fix in that supply chain to move the transportation, basically the supply from restaurants to grocery stores. And so instead that food went to waste. And that just goes back to the value of supporting your rural areas. You know, we, we have to have a supply chain within a local community close enough so that when something big happens or we have a hurricane in the middle of our country, we, we're not without food, you know, globally or nationally um, or even in our rural areas. And so um, I, again, go back to commend the value and what's become more and more of a passion of mine is really taking care of our rural communities and our farmers and our, yeah, the, those boutique you know, it, crawl. I can't tell you how many local fruits and vegetable farmers have gone out of business because they can't compete with big scale at the grocery store levels. And now, you know, now there's not food or supply to the local grocery stores because we can't get shipments. So, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. I, I seen uh, I seen John Porterfield here talk about yeah. um, AI, and so. You know, that this is a buzzword, really, AI, really. It's just data that is extracted and, you know, the algorithms can give you amazing data on, you know, the different benefits of, you know, doing one thing over another or give, you know, give you options, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the, the power of the AI. We talked about free speech a little bit right there, too. So this all... This all connects. I had said this a couple different times, and I believe all real and true information is a circle. It's connected, whether it's mathematics, whether it's physics, whether it's science, whether it's props, whether it's me or you. Uh, it's a mycelium network, essentially. Yeah. The circle, if it's true and it's real, uh, it is connected in that sense. And uh, AI uh, and uh, the network that we are bringing, we talked about sleep health, we talked about bees and agriculture. Uh, we also talked to, you got into the AI. So we're we have the ability to track all this data on our own censored free uh, network that we created. Uh, no, one, no one can turn it off. We're, we're, we're launching this. No one can say, hey, uh, you're the wrong type of uh, political view, or you're the wrong type of agricultural view, or you're uh, talking about you're talking about pesticides and shouldn't be, or that's not a gen money generator, and we shouldn't be sharing that info, right? Right. Yeah. We have a network, um, and uh, we do have a so we do have a couple social media networks we're working with, uh, but this free speech is really important. Um, we we're collecting our own data. And remember, Bitcoin only became, you know, something because, you know, someone else was saying you can't do that with your money. So Bitcoin became popular because you can't tell me what to do with my own money if I'm doing the right things. I'm not doing anything wrong. Same thing is true with this reset. We all got to be on the same page and we all got to 
uh, know that we're in it for each other. And I think it's important to, to talk about that because no one really is talking about that, but we all know it's the truth. All right. Well, I appreciate that you brought it up, you know, because when we talk about about how we communicate and what we're sharing, my goal really is to collaborate with those people that are doing it right and get the right message out. And sometimes the right message isn't the best message to hear, right? But it's something that we need to be talking about and have the ability to talk about it. That's why we live here, right? So how can I help there? And where? What can we kind of expect in the future for this platform and for where you're at as far as being able to communicate? What we can see with this platform is a sensor free platform and that can be something that can help you know everyday local local people and farmers help monetize get their information out there better and not only that um just just having the right setup with you know um with all the benefits we enjoy and i'm i'm speaking worldwide i know we got a lot of people from canada yeah. uh, other places but yeah i mean there's really is no boundaries with this network because there is no ground you know a line in the sand uh so the, the the cool thing is there's no line in the sand there is no uh there's just there's only information and however you take that information is up to you i would love it well, I think Kate made a good point, John. I'd love to have you back again. We're out of time, but I'd love a monthly update, especially on this platform and how bees are. You know, we're getting ready to get into planting. People are buying seeds left and right right now, getting ready to prepare and plant, you know, tens and thousands of acres of hemp. And however, we can support both the bees and our farmers to maximize their yield is, yeah, right where I speaks to my heart <laughs> why I'm doing this. So awesome. well we're planning on getting our own hemp farm here soon too. So Okay. Uh like I said, I spoke about Dr. Greg. It's definitely uh he could be your he could be all of our chief medical officers. I've never met someone so amazing. I feel very lucky you guys have met Mike too. I'm yeah. surrounded by I'm the youngest guy on the team. Uh we got incredible people. Incredible. Yeah we've got Eastwood on our team too. Okay. He's basically clinics, but, uh, but we've got some awesome guys on the team and um, I'm looking wait. forward to getting on again. I'm, I'm looking forward to get some of the other guys involved. Uh, they're more in tune with the AI, like I said, in the technology side of data collection, extraction, and then our chief medical officer is right on the forefront of, of all the information with healing, technology, uh, I'm just the flip-flop wearing CEO. That's what they call it. That likes bees and, you know, things like that. Well, you've done a good job surrounding yourself with people that are very bright. Michael's a very bright man. And yeah, it's been interesting and very fun watching all of the projects come, come to surface. So I'm excited. Very. Well, thank you very much. I guess I'll see you uh, today's Thursday, right? So I'll see you tomorrow. Yes. Looking forward to the call tomorrow. Awesome. awesome. And we talk about textiles, more textiles. And so that's yep. exciting. That's exciting. So perfect. Cool. Well, thank you very much, you guys. If you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out to me. If you'd like to get in touch with John, don't hesitate to connect with him. I added his LinkedIn profile on the chat. Um, other than that, like, share, join, follow, subscribe. Uh, we'd love to have you involved. And if you would like to join any of our meetings, let me know and I will get you plugged in. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Mandy. Have a good one. See you guys.